When I came from Germany 30 some years ago, I realized on the East Coast I did not see so much First Nation culture and I didn't know why that was the case. I believe it's very important that First Nations get more recognition in North America and the world and so that's a big part of what we're doing here. We bring our old ancestors' ways into today, just to keep that alive. The meaning behind my art would be about the residential school survivors and missing and murdered indigenous women. I talk about things that are happening in my life at the moment. My spirit name is uh, Meskeke No Den, which is medicine wing. So then when I have my name, I felt like I have to share whatever I know and teach the young kids. Friends United is reviving our culture back. Here you feel supported and nurtured. Like we all, at some point in our life, need that moment that somebody says, I believe in you. The center just helps us be a community within just artists. Friends United is a team of many people with the same idea to work together constructively to honor First Nations and to make sure they have their place in history and to really to promote peace, friendship and reconciliation. Hello and welcome to the Friends United International Convention Center in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, Canada. My guest today is Hereditary Chief Stephen Augustine, and he is a very important player in this initiative. And I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me here, Nancy. Congrat congratulations Thank you. on this amazing center and the bigger project. How did it start for you? Well, uh, I knew that uh, Ralph was uh, encouraging uh, young Aboriginal people um, into the field of art by supplying canvas and paints and brushes to these young people who had no way of purchasing uh, these supplies because they're very expensive for a lot of them. And most of them are, are uh, um, they're uh, below the poverty line. They're living on First Nations communities and they don't, they don't have any jobs. So welfare or social assistance is one of their ways of, of surviving. And when Rolf came along, uh, he met several young people that were uh, displayed a, a sense of uh, artistic ability. And so he, 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 he knew that some of them were, were having difficulties with drugs and, and alcohol, and he was trying to encourage them to uh, steer away from that way of life, and, uh, and uh, he wanted to encourage them to take up art, and, and he, he basically became the promoter of, of their artwork. And one of, the, one of the first issues I had with, with the way uh, Ralph was going about um, indigenous art was, I think at some point in time he felt uh, um, indigenous art in Canada was almost uh, synonymous with one another. Like I mean, the, and and I was trying to mention to him that uh, the predominant style that he 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 had encouraged, and, and I think uh, in a lot of ways our own young people. Uh, encourage themselves to follow this woodland style of, of artwork, uh, which um, Norval Morriso, an Ojibwe artist from Ontario, um, he was uh, a spiritual person, um, and, and he brought his spirituality into the form of artwork, and, and he used uh, this similar style of almost like um, looking through a body, almost like a, an X-ray view of, of a body. But the way he explained it to me was uh, being a medicine person or a spiritual man, he could look directly at the sun without going blind or, or anything. And he said he looked at it long enough that he would look away 
and, and he would look at you and he would see all these bright yellow, red colors, kind of almost interspersed with black lines, like all the artwork that's on, on the walls. And so he was the person that was instrumental in developing this kind of uh, style of artwork. And, and it, it also emanated from petroglyphic work mm -hmm. that the Ojibwe Anishinaabe people um, inscribed on rocks, on stones, stone faces. And in Ontario, around Peterborough, there's a whole big area where they, they've been inscribing all their like animals and boats and people on stone. Wow. So he kind of grabs this imagery and incorporates with color, bright colors, because of his experience with uh, looking directly into, into the sun. So I was kind of mentioned to, to Rolf, I said, um, it's all in well to encourage our, our people to draw and paint and whatever, uh, but the style they're, they're following is not indigenous to our style. Mm -hmm. and, and I mentioned to him uh, an artist by the name of Alan Silliboy, and Teresa Marshall from, from here in, I mean, from Nova Scotia. Who are Mi'kmaq artists. Who are Mi'kmaq artists who were mostly uh, um, using iconographic art of the Mi'kmaq people. Alan Silliboy also drew from the stone petroglyphs in Kejim Kujik uh, National Park. Mm -hmm. there, there's all kinds of stones there. And so he, he brings those out, the images, and he uses the imagery to form his artwork, mm -hmm. and, but also rendering it into color. So all the bright reds and blues, and, and it, so it, it, it's a style of art that kind of, you know, it's, it's from Mi'kma'ki because of the petroglyphs that our people know, you know, that they're endeared to. Um, so Teresa Marshall is another artist who has copied uh, Mi'kmaq like porcupine quill work mm -hmm. on birch bark boxes yes. and containers and chairs and back of chairs and seats of chairs have been decorated like that. And the work of our ancestors in the 1800s, uh, Christine, Christine Paul, or um, she, uh, she, she did some work in the, she was born in 1800, but in the 1850s and 60s, her artwork was very much in demand in Europe, in England. People came from England, uh, colonial administrators came specifically uh, looking for her and asking, can you make something out of this using your design, your, your, your quill work? And, and also she used uh, beadwork to decorate clothing. So Teresa Marshall, a visual artist with oil and acrylic paints, uh, she, she paints these imagery and she goes more creative with, with that imagery of like the iconic, iconographic kind of images from our ancestors in the 1800s and, and Alan Silliboy from the petroglyphs. So it's, it's both of these two artists are, are, are very successful and, and they've had exhibits. Uh, we had Teresa Marshall's exhibit at our Cape Breton University Art Gallery and Alan Silliboy had expositions uh, at our uh, library and at uh, St. Francis Xavier University. He's, he's had exhibitions there as well as the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. So both have had these as well on a, on a national level. Uh, so it's very uh, and, and so I tried to encourage uh, Rolf to get in touch with these two people and possibly act. And, and one of the things I, I, I jump back to um, in terms of copying Ojibwe style, it's, it's uh, the group of seven artists in Canada, Lismer and uh, quite a few, mm -hmm. seven of them, mm -hmm. They, a lot of them went to Europe to study under, under the uh, European artists, you know, the, the expressionists, you know, yes. and, and so like Monet and, and they, they looked at this artwork and went to school and studied and copied it. So 
in some way, uh, in, when I was kind of catching my breath and seeing all the beautiful art that's here, I said, well, they're copying maybe now, but slowly they're going to come around and start to develop their own artistic style. It evolves. Yes. Yeah. And, and so I think a lot of the, like the Canadian artists, they, they emulated some of the work by Gauguin and, and, and those others, Monet and Rembrandt in, in Europe, and, and they brought that style here to Canada, but then they developed their own, the scenery, I mean, the, the wild, the, the north of uh, Ontario and uh, British Columbia and so on. So. Well, I love, one of the things that has inspired me about what I've learned here is the concept of artists from across the country coming together and sharing their ideas and their, their spirits and connecting. And I feel like so much of this place and this project is about connection. Yes. Uh... Whether it's art, you know, whether it's, it's the artist's connection to the land, to Mother Earth, or it's the connection between artists, or connection, which I think is so important as well, between the First Nations or Indigenous work and regular Canadians who don't have enough understanding of our history from your perspective. Yes. And I, I just see that this can be such a key to helping all Canadians understand the depth and breadth and, and richness of our history. Yes, I mean, like with the indigenous culture and society, uh, I share a lot about the Mi'kmaq creation story everywhere I go and I tell it, I, usually I need about 35 minutes to, to fully express the creation story. But, uh, and you do a Reader's Digest version? Now you've got me curious. Well, okay. I mean, there are seven levels of creation. We have the giver of life, or the mystery of creation, or uh, we say gizulk. I mean, it's, it's a verb in our language, which means you have been created, you are being created, and you're going to continue to wow. be created. Beautiful. Uh, and, and it's a great mystery. We don't know, we don't attribute any human element to, like in, in and I, I don't mean any offense to any religion, mm -hmm. but, but when I was small, I was, I was brought up as a Roman Catholic, and when I opened the, the, the Bible, you see a God, a bearded man looking down from the sky, mm -hmm. and, and, and there's rays of sunlight kind of hitting the earth. I mean, for me, that was like, okay, that's God. I mean, uh, I, I feared God. I mean, I grew up fearing God. Anyway, so, uh, in our context, uh, we don't attribute any human figure or human, because we don't think any human is powerful enough to represent creation. Mm -hmm. so, so we call it the great surprise or the great mystery. And, and it created everything that's here before humanity arrived. So the next thing that was created is the sun we call grandfather. And, and, and the reflection of the sun goes to the moon, which we call the grandfather, a grandmother, grandmother moon. But um, the earth itself we call usitkamu. Uh, if I had a flat piece of area, this part would be called weskiju in, in Mi'kmaq, uskiju. And you stand up on it and you say, Weskitka ami, but the shorter term for it would be usitkamu, which means the earth itself, that humanity was formed on the earth. Uh, so the first three levels of creation is one gives life, grandfather, son, he puts a shadow on us. And in our language, that shadow we call, that we see following us all the time, chija uh, amij. My, my shadow, in, 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 in a very mundane sense, mm -hmm. but if in a, talking about it in a spiritual sense, it's a spirit of my ancestors who have gone into the spirit world and they're every day following me around wow. everywhere I go. So we give thanks to Grandfather Son for giving us the ability to see those spirits that are following us everywhere we go. 
And so we are always grateful to Grandfather Son for putting the spirit into us and connecting us with our feet, with our ancestors. And that representation is following us everywhere and we're not alone. We're, uh, so, and then Mother Earth, uh, with, with four main elements mixed in with another four elements, it's like birds, plants, animals, and fish. These are our relatives. They belong to Mother Earth as much as we belong to Mother Earth. So, and then the other four is earth, fire, water, and wind. So combination of these eight elements, we create seven elements, which is our food, our medicine, our shelter, our clothing, our tools of survival, our, our methods or modes of travel on water, on snow, on ice, and on the earth, and our ability to negotiate for our survival with our drumming, our singing, our dancing, and, and our pipe ceremonies and our sweat lodge ceremonies. This is how we negotiate our survival through this, these ceremonies. So we give thanks to Giver of Life, Grandfather, Son, and Mother Earth for giving us the sustenance to survive. And then we look to the east, we thank Gluskap or Geluluskap, or the first person who spoke. We don't use gender in our language. We don't know whether Gluskap was a man or a woman. But after uh, civilization, after Christianity arrived to us, that person became a man. <laughs> Gluskap became a man. And then, uh, so he was the first person that was created on Mother Earth with three bolts of lightning. The first one shaped him. The second one gave him all the other extremities and seven sacred parts to his head. Two ears, two eyes, two holes in a nose and the mouth. And our elders teach us uh, there is a moral moralistic kind of teaching that comes from that. They say, well, you have to listen first mm -hmm. from your heart. You have to look upon other people from the goodness of your heart. And you have to sense, like, your place and my place by the sense of your nose. And our, our elders teach us in, when we were little kids. I mean, uh, you, you know how your home smells like mm -hmm. and how your relatives smell like. But when you go somewhere else, you know what a stranger smells like. Mm -hmm. They don't smell like, like your family because they cook different food, they use different uh, ingredients to clean things and whatever. And so you know a stranger when you, when, when you come across one. So that sense of smell is also a very uh, moralistic con context of you don't get too close to other people, mm -hmm. even if they're your relatives. I mean, you have to respect that social distance or comfortable comfort zone, that sense of smell. And, and when we are born and brought into the world, your first breath came through your nostrils because your mouth was all clogged uh, before you start to cough and the, the, to, to uh, exhale. Yeah. You cough out all the, everything that's kind of blocking your passages to, and then you scream, mm -hmm. your voice comes out. Yes. So our elders tell us that if you exercise these instruments in a proper way, you listen and you look and you sense your place. So when it's time to uh, breathe the same air that we all breathe, we also share the water that comes from Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And the food that comes from Mother Earth belongs to everybody. It's not, our, mm -hmm. it's not ours to call our own. It's to be shared with everybody that's alive and up, 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 standing upright on Mother Earth. So Gluskap was, was this person in the third bolt of lightning. He was able to rise up and, and walk around and discover his world. And his shadow was following him everywhere he went. And so he came into the world and an eagle kind of came down to visit him. And the eagle said, I am the messenger of the giver of life, Grandfather, Son, and Mother Earth. And if you want to talk to them, uh, talk to them through me. And the eagle flies up into the sky, but a feather falls down, an eagle feather. Mm -hmm. And before it hit the earth, Glooskap picked it up 
and when he held it in his hands, he felt much strength and fortitude, I mean, very strong. And he looked up into the sky and the eagle just circled around and flew away and he held up the, the eagle feather. So this is how uh, the first the first three levels and, and now Glooskap arrives. He travels around, discovers his, and he comes back to where he was given his creation. Three times the light, bolts of lightning hit the earth and every time the, the spark hit the earth, it started to, the sparks flew in a, in a circular pattern around him. And three times the sparks flew out. And so when he left, after he was given his creation, he just stepped over the, the, the sparks. And he discovered his world and came back and he still saw this nice circle like, like that rug over there. Like, and, and in the middle, his, he saw an, an impression of himself. So he went there and he st stood there and he looked up into the sky at grandfather's son. And he saw this eagle coming. And this is where the eagle came down and told him, you know, that he is going to be the messenger. And the eagle also told him, you're going to discover your family who is going to help you understand your place in this world. So Glooskap turns around and he sees an old lady sitting on a rock. And he goes up to her and says, who are you? I mean, she was all bent over, she didn't have any clothes on, and, and she had white sparkling hair, and she was sitting on a rock, and he said, who are you? Where did you come from? She said, I am your grandmother. I am Nugumi. She said, I, I was created out of this rock early this morning when dew formed over this rock. Giver of life, grandfather, son, and mother earth brought me into cre existence as an old woman, already wise and knowledgeable. I'm here to teach you everything you need to know about surviving on Mother Earth. And so they collaborated with one another. And then Grandmother said, see those sparks that are left over from the bolt of lightning that caused your creation? Bring seven of these and put them in the middle. So he picked them up and put them in the middle. And then she, she told him, build a wigwam around these sparks and invite our cousin Whirlwind to visit. So he invites Whirlwind and the Whirlwind comes in from the east and swooshes by and causes heat and, and the wood to ignite and a fire is created. What we call our Akjibukto or the Great Spirit Fire. So, and then she tells Glooskap, call, call this little animal, Abhistanuj. And he calls the animal and he comes and, and the animal says, what do you want, my brother? He says, well, grandmother asked me to invite you, but we, I have to ask you to give up your life so that grandmother and I can continue to live. We need you for your skin, for our clothing, your meat for our food, your bones for our tools, your internal organs for our medicines, our shelter from your skin, our tools of survival, and everything. You can provide to them, them to us. The little animal says, yes, go ahead, take my life. And Glooskap brings the animal to grandmother. Grandmother snaps his neck and asks Glooskap to apologize, the giver of life, grandfather, son, and mother earth. And he lifts up his eagle feather and he says, oh, forgive me for taking the life of this animal, your creation. Grandfather, son, I'm sorry I've taken the shadow of my brother, the animal. And Mother Earth, I'm sorry I've taken part of your creation for my survival. And, and so I, I offer you my apology. So, but then he looks at grandmother and he looks up in the sky and he smiles and he says, if all of you are so great, why don't you give back the animal his life? And the animal wakes up and in its place is another dead animal. And he tells Abhistanuj, go back in the forest and we will share this relationship forever. So the animal goes back and he brings the dead one to grandmother and grandmother skins it and everything. And so they cook the meat on the fire, the chibukto. And so they celebrate grandmother's arrival to the world by eating a feast of meat. 
So that's, that's the story of grandmother. And then grandmother is busy, glue scap, decides to take a walk by the water, and he's walking along this tall, sweet-smelling grass, and a young man stands up, really tall, white, sparkling eyes, and looks at him and says, Who are you? Where do you come from? He says, You don't know me, uh, my uncle. I am your nephew. I am your sister's son. I owe my existence when whirlwind passed by in the ocean, caused the waters to roil up and foam began to form on top of the waters, and he got blown to the shore and rested on this sweet-smelling grass. And with the help of the giver of life, grandfather, son, and mother earth, brought me into existence as a young man. He said, I am the gift from our ancestors. And I have the vision. I have these two eyes that are looking at you. And Glooscap realized, well, young people are here. They're the backbone of our nation. They're the strongest. They're, they're, they're going to help us create our world. And also, I have to be mindful of how I live my life in front of those eyes. Those two eyes are watching me. So it's almost like a, a rule of law, those young people that govern us, young people's watching us. And so we have to leave a legacy of survival for them, so we have to be careful how we live in front of those young children. So our elders are always teaching us this. Be careful what you do in front of those kids. If you fight, if you fight your wife, or if you drink, or you do drugs or alcohol, whatever, uh, they will do it. But you know what? Because they love you, they will do it better than you. So be careful what you do in front of those children. And, and so that, that's the nephew that comes into the world. He comes into creation from the, the foam, from the ocean, and the blending with the sweet grass and, and given his creation. So Glooscap tells him, go and ask the fish to come ashore and offer themselves. And in the meantime, Glooscap does the same thing, apologizes for the fish and, and also asking giver of life and grandfather, son, and mother earth to, to have more fish in the world so they can continue this relationship mm -hmm. with the fish. And so the grandmother prepares a feast of fish to honor the young man's arrival to the world. So, and then young man, grandmother, Glooscap. Glooscap is sitting by the fire by himself one day and a woman comes and puts her arm around him. Says, Gauchinan quiz, meaning in our language, are you cold, my son? And he looks at her and says, who are you? Where did you come from? She said, I was a leaf on a tree that fell to the ground and dew formed over this leaf. And with the help of the giver of life, grandfather, son, and mother earth, gave me a body of a young woman. I am strong, I bring strength for my children, and I bring all the colors of the world into our world. And, and she said, uh, since, since I come from, from the tree, uh, I am knowledgeable about all the healing powers of plants. Mm -hmm. So Glooscap uh, welcomes his mother and says to young man, Go and gather the food from the plants and the roots and the trees and bring it together. And, and so they brought all of this together to celebrate Glooscap's mother's arrival to the world. And so th these are the seven levels of creation that uh, they were the initial relationships between humanity, Mother Earth, the humanity among us was created on the earth and, and the first one peeled himself off Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. So there's an ideology that we belong to the earth mm -hmm. as much as the birds, plants, animals, and the rooted things, the trees and the plants. We are part of her creation and we are all relatives. We are all related to the birds, plants, animals, and fish. So in that context, I mean, uh, it goes on a little bit longer about spirituality and ceremonies and all that stuff, like uh, uh, seven original families separate into seven different geographic areas, Mi'kmaq people being one of them, the Cree is another one, the Ojibwe is another one, the Blackfoot is another one, the, the Abenaki is another one, the Wamp Wampanoags in, in down in Boston, Maine, I mean, mm -hmm. down South Boston area. So. Altogether, there were like seven original families. 
that emanated from this central fire and they, they separated. And when they arrived to what we call Migamagi, in order not to forget the significance and the meaning of the seven levels of creation, we divided ourselves into seven fires, seven fires, sacred fires, and with a chief or leader in, for each of those areas. So the Maritimes is divided into seven Migma districts, we call them, but Mawiomi is the, the better word for it because it was around central fires that people kind of, they, they traveled away, they came together, they, they came under this, what we call a Mawiomi concept is a, it's like a shelter. And we're, we're sharing the chief's responsibility, like I'm a hereditary, my responsibility would have been to make sure that everybody has food, everybody had medicine, everybody has clothing and shelter, tools of survival, and they could travel about quite freely. So that was my role as a hereditary chief to make sure they're, they're all sharing the, the wealth of the land and that they're not overstepping each other's, uh, they're not like taking life, a way of life from, from each other. Can I ask, what does it mean to be an hereditary chief? Well, means that uh, I, I, I've been born into a, my father was a chief, his father was a chief, and, and it goes back many centuries. And uh, I mean, we can trace historically Michael Augustine, who signed a treaty in 1760, on, on March 10 in Halifax. And, and he had a, I mean, I can name off the, the lineage. I mean, like he had a son named Peter. Peter had a son, Noel. And Noel had a son named Tom. Tom had a son named Noel Tom and Basil Tom. Basil Tom happened to be my, my grandfather on my father's side. And Noel Tom was my great grandfather from my mother's side. Because Noel Tom had a daughter named Isabel, Isabel had a son named John. John had a daughter named Rita, who was my mother. And yeah. so I can go back and kind of, and, and in, initially really, uh, in order for us as indigenous people to speak with any, any authority as an hereditary chief, I would have to name off my lineage to, mm -hmm. at, at a gathering uh, of indigenous peoples and to, to be able to say, well, I can speak on behalf of these line of, of, of ancestors, and, and, it, and it kind of fans out like this as like a couple of thousand, three thousand, five thousand people, Mi'kmaq people from, from a certain geographic area. But it's like presenting your credentials. Yes, well, you have to. Your historic credentials, yeah. Account for it. I mean, that was our only way to, to keep our relationships uh, and our knowledge about who, who was related to who, who belonged to which family, who could marry who. And it was always the grandmothers that were keeping all this mental record of who, who can marry who. Oh, that's fascinating. What was your childhood like? Well, I grew up on the reserve in Big Cove. It was called Big Cove. I was born on the reserve. My great-grandmother, uh, Isabel Augustine, she was a midwife. She delivered uh, over, I don't know, maybe 200 children in our community as well as in, in, in non-Indigenous communities, uh, non-Native women uh, in town or across the river that come and ask if the old lady could come and help them mm -hmm. deliver their child. And so she was quite known. And she, when she died, she was 96 years old. Wow. And uh, she had delivered many. So she delivered me. Mm -hmm. She brought me into this world. And my father's mother, my grandmother, um, she told me that she was there when I was born and that uh, the old, my great grandmother brought me into the world. First thing she did was she touched my head to the, to the earth. She said, uh, This is your son, Mother, Mother Earth. Know your son. We are going to raise him as a, as a leader. And so my father, you know, I was given over to my father. My father took me to this, uh, they had a barrel, a wooden barrel, 
buried into into the into the earth and there was like spring water coming out of the ground like it was bubbling right. and so the barrel kind of was tall enough to hold a bucket to dip in there to for our family to get and and our neighbors also used to come and get water from there but my father took me and threw me in the, in in this in this well it was ice cold water I didn't feel anything. I mean, I don't even remember. <laughs> but my father was telling me and my grandmother said, that's how you were brought into the world. This is how indigenous people made sure that a child, when they're born, that they could survive. And this was a way of testing whether you can withstand the elements of the cold element and, 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 and water also cleans you out more. I mean, uh, your, all your nostril and your, and your mouth. So I was tossed around in this and, and then brought back to, to my mother's um, breast. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was, and then a week later when my belly button fell off, I mean, uh, my father took it and hung it on a tree, a pine tree. And we call this uh, guo in our language. And uh, Istuguo is sort of like a twisted, gnarly old pine tree that nobody's going to cut. Mm -hmm. So they attach it to this. And uh, Gisigu, Gisigu is like an old man. And Guo is like a, the pine tree. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our old leaders, uh, Sa'amau, which means Mao Sa, means the oldest, the oldest one. Sa'amau Gizigu, meaning he's the twisted old gnarled pine tree oh. who's our leader because he's the oldest and the wisest. So the term in our language, Gizigu Sa'amau, uh, means uh, that he's a leader. So tying the belly button on, onto that tree ensures that the spirit of the tree is going to look after me for the rest of my life and, and that I would be raised to, to um, become a leader for my peoples. And you didn't spend your, uh, all of your youth in Canada. Well, um, I grew up in, in my community in, in Elsie Booktuk. Today they call it Elsie Booktuk, but way back when they used to call it Big Cove. Mm -hmm. And I was born there, so I grew up there for the first nine years of my life. But when I was six, seven, eight years old, my grandfather, Johnny Simon, came and he always came and took me with him. And uh, he always called me my younger brother, Chiganam. Oh. Uh, I, I never knew until I found out that uh, I was a generation higher than him in terms of uh, my... Uh, your lineage? My lineage, yeah. yeah. And, and he was always calling me my younger brother. Interesting. A anyway, so he took me everywhere. We lived on the land from April, uh, April, May, June, July, August, September, until October. Like we lived out on the land in, along the water uh, around the harbor of Rishabakto. <clears throat> so we were spearing eel, fishing, setting nets for salmon, striped bass, uh, trout, I mean, smelts, shad, I mean, all mackerel, all the... And living like your ancestors would have lived. Yes, and, and some later on in the, in the summer, like around end of July, August, we start eating the berries from the, from the land. But we, we took uh, flour, we took sugar, we took lard, um, and basically, sometimes he'd, he'd trade fish for uh, pork with, with the farmers and some of the Acadian fishermen that uh, they raised pigs so they would have pork and um, he would trade for it. Yeah. So we lived uh, along the coastline all summer and I, I learned from him about the land and, and the water and how to fish, where, where the best place to fish and everything. Then at it's interesting to me because I, I have this image of him living on the land with you, but I also see him grounding you for your life. Yes. You know, you were grounded in, in the history and the, the culture. Like, uh, <clears throat> we would go by boat 
along the, and, and the water would be about this deep, <clears throat> about um, maybe two feet, not even. And we were pushing our, our boat, it's a flat, flat bottom boat. Mm -hmm. And he had a, he picked some of the roots from a pine tree that were sticking out along the coastline, like dead, dead branches, but they were full of um, pitch. Uh, some of the oil or whatever, the, the sap from the pine tree, right. and it becomes very concentrated in the roots. So when you break a dead pine tree root, it's just, you can just light it with a match or something, and uh, it, it will just automatically ignite. It's so resinous. And so we would use those and burn them at night to be able to see the eel in, in, under, the, under the water. And we would be pushing our boat along, and every once in a while we would spear an eel. But we had to be, you couldn't really just throw your spear like this. Mm -hmm. You had to kind of like slowly edge your, edge your spear towards the eel, and then like you're a few inches above, and then he just goes down so gently. Mm -hmm. and he, picks up and usually the fork is like this, the eel is kind of stuck there and on the edge of the boat he just go like this and it'll fall off and in, into the bottom of the boat and that's where all the eels and we would get about two, three hundred pound in one night wow. and we would go sell it at the fish market and he would get some more food and he would get himself a bottle of wine and um, so this was uh, what, 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 I, what I learned with him, and he showed me how to spear the eel, like he, he held the spear for me, and we were push, pushing, and he says, okay, okay, don't, and he'll, he'll help me, kind of, and then, and finally, you know, we'd be pushing, pushing. It was kind of a big spear for me at nine years old. I mean, it's uh, awkward, and so I didn't realize that I had speared an eel, and I lift the spear up, and I try to unhook it, and, and I look back, and he was sitting <laughs> in the back. He had stopped holding the spear, and I didn't realize that he had, he had stopped holling it. Mm -hmm. And I was just ecstatic, because I, I, I speared an eel all by myself. I didn't even realize I was alone. <laughs> I mean, spearing alone. That sense of independence yeah. and maturity. Yeah. Incredible. Anyway, so... So it sounds like an idyllic childhood. It was. I mean, uh, I, I, I hadn't really started school yet. I mean, uh, I was sickly when I was young. I had rickets, and uh, so they took very good care of me. I mean, I, I, th there was a fear of handling me because my bones went soft mm. with the rickets. And so they, they, they always kind of left me alone. And then when I was kind of strong enough, uh, six and a half, seven years old. I didn't even start school yet. And uh, my grandfather came and he said, I'll, I'll fix him up and mm -hmm. started giving me like grease from the bear and, and uh, uh, eel, I mean, all this good fresh food from the land. I mean, uh, it really helped give me the strength that I needed to. And so off we went to Germany. My dad was in the army, he was in the he was in the uh, he was in the Second World War. He landed in Normandy. He came back. I mean, uh, he was captured twice by by the Germans. But each time, they let him go. They let him escape. Really. And at one point in time, he, he, they let him take a motorcycle a German motorcycle, <laughs> and he was trying to get back to his line, like his, back to the military. And it was his, his own people that shot him and kind of shot through his, through his arm. And so he ditched the bike and he laid in the ditch for, until it got dark and he crawled all the way back to, the, to his military base there. And it was only at dark he jumped up and he says, I'm Augustine, I'm, I'm, I'm part of your army. He said, and they didn't shoot him that time, but he was injured. He was, he was always showing us the bullet wound in his arm. And uh, anyway, so, and uh, partly, I, I think the German people were very uh, 
enamored, enamored. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they loved indigenous people, Indians in North America, mm -hmm. because of this guy here, Karl May, had yes. developed the literature and created films in Germany. This is a, a prolific series, right, of books? Yes. And movies? Yes, films? yes. So ah. I had friends in Germany. So tell us what the books are about. Well, the books are about Indians in, in North America, and it's a typical, um, but mostly from the United States, like uh, the Lakota people, the Sioux, they call them Lakota Sioux, the Crows and the Cheyennes, and, and, and it's those cultures that um, ride, rode uh, horses. They also had canoes, Ojibwe, Chippewas, they called them in the United States. So he, he developed stories about certain chiefs and uh, certain individuals and leaders and how they survived in, 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 in their lands and their traditional way of living. And so you and your friends in Germany would play out scenes from these books? Well, they, 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 they had scenes, yes. They had uh, seen cowboys and westerns and uh, they used to call them spaghetti westerns. And, some of them were filmed in Czechoslovakia, some of them were in south of France, some of them were in Spain, and some were in Italy, uh, just to create, recreate the, the scenery of the, um, the plains mm -hmm. in the in, in United States. And so they would be riding horses and they'd have all the Indian dress. I mean, it was so um, almost accurate in terms of the, the way they depicted the Lakota people. You could. You couldn't tell the difference between the Europeans playing the role of the indigenous people. And uh, I, I saw some of those films. And then we would go outside and we'd start playing. And uh, everybody wanted to be an Indianer. <laughs> All the German boys ended up becoming Indians and I was the only guy that became a cowboy. I love I, that. I had to play the role of a cowboy <laughs> with my friends Heinze and Dietmar and Heinz, Karl Heinz, and uh, there was a, I don't know, there was about six or seven of the, of, of the group. Mm. But among the German kids too, there were like another group of kids that were like a bit bigger than them, and they were like, they saw them as bullies. Yeah. Like they were, and uh, one day they, they would say, here comes the bullies, you know, and everybody start running this way, and then they stopped. And they start pushing me, <laughs> and they start yelling to the guys, we have an Indian with us. <laughs> Our friend Gluskap. <laughs> <laughs> friend Gluskap. And I had a big long stick, uh, I don't know, it's almost like a, one of those clothesline posts, you know, like uh, to hold up the clothesline. Anyway, I, I grabbed it and I started running towards them and, and I started charging. And uh, they ran away, and <laughs> my friends, they were always coming and uh, looking for me to play with them and be their friend and help them and protect them. <laughs> so it seems to me, what I'm hearing is that there was a sense of reverence for indigenous people in, in North America among the Germans. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. And, and that might have been very different if you were growing up in Canada. Uh, oh, yes. Right? I love the fact that there's an, an interesting tie-in between you and Rolf Bowman who started this center because, you know, so many people say, who is this uh, German immigrant to Nova Scotia who has shown such extraordinary generosity? And there are people who think, you know, it can't be, it can't be for real because it's, it's too good to be true yes. is sort of the theme that I, I hear. Well, there's, there, there, I think initially there was a sense of distrust, yes. like, um, um, indigenous people over the years, I mean, they've been sort of um, not treated very well. Uh, their land was kind of taken away. The children were taken away off to residential schools. And, and so they, they always looked at non-indigenous people with suspicion, you know, they've come here, they're stealing our land, they're stealing our children, now they're going to steal us next or something, you know, like... Which you can understand, of course, they would be suspicious or on guard. So when, when well, Rolf, I mean, with all good intentions, uh, you know, offered to help uh, a lot of these artists, uh, some of the critics, I mean, indigenous critics, I mean, uh, 
uh, and I must admit, I was one of them initially. Mm -hmm. I mean... As a protector, you, you had a protector role. Yes. And once I realized, I mean, he had really a good heart. I mean, he was honest and he wasn't stealing the artwork from the indigenous people. In fact, he was promoting it mm -hmm. and making them um, become more famous, I guess, than, than they would have been normally had they tried to sell their goods uh, somewhere, uh, try to break into the niche market of artists, mm -hmm. let alone Aboriginal. I mean, uh, so for me, I, th I think it, it's created an opportunity for indigenous peoples to, to, you know, excel and to exercise their ability. And, and like you said earlier about other indigenous people coming here and becoming like mentors or, mm -hmm. or um, guides to help indigenous people here, they learn how to start to mix the paint, mm -hmm. how to create, how to blend colors, how to make shape and forms and, and, and to be able to look at things in a very uh, artful way, I mean, uh, perspective. I mean, you see things far away getting smaller and fading and those that are closer. I mean, so you start to incorporate these kind of um, imagery in your artwork. So you have depth in your art. You have, you know, the pieces almost come alive. And as I was telling the creation story, our cultures, when you look at all the things you see hanging around this room, it's about animals, it's about birds, it's about plants and fish. It's about food and clothing and medicine and, and shelter. You see wigwams and, and teepees being painted. And, and all of our connection and relationship to, to the land is, is being expressed by these individuals. And what I find very integral and very important for our people, because there's an... In, in, um, it's almost instinctual, the idea of art with, with our, I'm an artist, but I never went and took any training, but I could sit down and, and really create beautiful, wonderful art. I can carve it. I can, I can. It's in your DNA, that ability probably. But one of the, one of the stumbling blocks, I guess, to, to our culture is, is the ability to express from inside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with the residential school experience of our people, which started in the 1880s, um, the, the, the crafters or fathers of Confederation, mm -hmm. John A. MacDonald, um, they wanted to, I mean, uh, I think they thought it was a, a good intent on their part to try to make you like me. To assimilate, yes. Yes, to assimilate. But they, they, they were doing it a little bit too aggressively, mm -hmm. that they said, well, we're going to erase the Indian problem in Canada. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take the children and educate them in the schools. And when they come out, they're not going to remember much about their indigenous mm -hmm. background. They're not going to speak their indigenous languages, and they're going to dress like us. So that was the intent of the residential schools. And although the other outcome of that was, was um, sexual violence, physical violence, and um, all of those th bad things that happened in residential schools, even children died in residential schools. They starved to death and some of them were sick and they didn't get medical help. And, uh, and so that aspect of the residential school was the negative element that, that kind of permeated our culture collectively across Canada. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were kind of corralled, like you would do with deer or yes. caribou, into a small place called a reserve. Mm -hmm. And the federal government says, you stay there and we will look after your food, your medicine, your shelter, your clothing, your education, like your tools of survival. Mm -hmm. Our tools of survival today is education. Mm -hmm. So the government said, since we're taking you from the land and putting you in these small pieces, 
you don't go outside, we have to provide that for you. So that's why today the government provides for Indians on Indian reserves and the government provides housing and pays for education, but they don't pay enough education. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of young people that are graduating from high school, but they can't get in university because the government won't pay for their education in university. And, and this is free in Europe. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, and, and for our people, it would be nice if, if everybody had the opportunity to advance themselves in terms of education. Mm -hmm. It would be nice. I mean, we'd have a healthier society rather than poor people living in these little enclaves of, of poverty in our reserves. When you talk about the residential schools, the image I have, and it's, it's, I find it very emotional, um, is that they took the light away from these children. So it's like they extinguished, they wanted to extinguish that special light that was in them. And um, the other thing that is very powerful to me is that when you talk about the seven levels of creation, I can see a real symbolic connection to this project with Friends United, because on one level, it's paint, it's creative expression. On another level, it's allowing your soul to be expressed through the art. On another level, it's connection between you and nature, you and artists, you and the viewer of the, on another level, you know, there's all these levels, but on the top level for me, it's a beautiful possibility of moving our society from a place of prejudice to a pre place of reverence for Indigenous Canadians. And I, I said this in another of these, the series of interviews, because it sort of occurred to me at the time, but it keeps reverberating for me and in that it, it can be a bridge. Yeah. And, and it feels like, you know, the, the narrative, um, the way a lot of Canadians would look at the narrative of First Nations, Indigenous people, is that they were defeated and that they are a defeated people to some extent when you look at the, the problems, social issues and so on. But I, I love the idea that this puts a different filter on the lens. So it's about overcoming, not about defeat. And it's about um, coming out through that with a full, strong light again. Yes, uh, very much so. I mean, uh, that, that's the uh, mentality, I guess, uh, uh, of um, Canadian society, uh, looking upon indigenous people as defeated people that uh, there's no more hope for them uh, to some extent. And, but uh, like you say, you speak of the light, I mean, uh, there is a light, I mean, uh, and it's, and, and it's uh, that fire, that first mm -hmm. fire is, is like uh, inside of Mother Earth, it's, it's molten lava, yes. it's fire. Yes. And, 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 and this with water and air and, and, and our world above us uh, creates life, I mean, the spark that is beating your heart. It's, it comes, stems from that original fire uh, and, and that connection to the ancestors. Mm -hmm. You carry their blood and you're, you're, that, that blood is still alive and beating inside of you and, and we're part of this big, big cycle of life that you're gonna pass this on to your children or your brothers and sisters are carrying it uh, and, and it depends on who and what kind of a life you have. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's an open, it's open to a lot of interpretations of, of all life. I mean, whether you're bisexual or homosexual or, or heterosexual or, or transsexual. I mean, there, there's all these realities today that somehow uh, they were held down and hidden. And, and for some, uh, for some, uh, reason, 
uh, along with indigenous people kind of coming out and, and flowering, uh, glowing their light. I mean, the wind is starting to breeze, blow a little bit, and the, the image is starting to build stronger, stronger realities, I mean, uh, expressed through, through the arts. Yes, the light and the hope are so clear in these paintings. Yes. And I, I think that's why it's hard to stand before some of them and not feel emotion mm -hmm. because they feel so, you know, many of them joyful and hopeful. There are some that are, are reflecting struggle and pain and tragedy, but, but that's, there's hope in that as well because it's being expressed. Yes, one of the, one of the early projects I, I was involved in, um, in the mid early 1990s, um, we had a, a case in our community uh, where they would bring in uh, what they call a BTSD program, basic tr uh, technology, whatever. It was about uh, uh, general education development, like giving enough uh, training to individuals to get their equivalent of a grade 12. So we had this program that had started up three or four times earlier in, in, in the reserve's history. And I, I remember in the early 70s, I, I was taking training as a carpenter. But when I was done, I mean, the instructor said, you have no purpose here. You should go on, go to high school, go to university. I mean, he said, get a degree. Your, 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 your brain is far better than just being a carpenter. So anyway, it was a, like, a history of these kind of development uh, courses. But four times in a row they started them and everybody dropped out. Like they would start with 40 students and they were supposed to go to 52 week program. And then all of a sudden, um, my friend Alfred Sock from Big Cove, he says, we need to start one of these programs. And I, do you know, do you have a way we can make this thing better? And so I met a friend of mine, uh, my cousin, uh, Luke Simon. And I said, you want to join us? Uh, I have an idea uh, about keeping the kids in, in, in school. And there was a component of this education called life skills. And so the life skills component was the one that was driving them away. We, uh, we learned because in the life skills, I mean, you're supposed to learn about... Uh, hygiene, you know, brush your teeth, comb your hair, uh, wash your face and come with clean clothes, don't, don't smell bad when you're coming to. And uh, in our culture, when you, when you talk about that to, to another, it's a no-no. It's mm -hmm. kind of like that's one of the principles or morals or values or ethics in our culture. You don't tell other people anything about themselves. It's like total autonomy. You're sovereign to your own body, so you take care of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I'm not supposed to intervene in that, in your sovereignty. So... I feel badly now that I put that powder on your oh, forehead. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, so we, we discovered this, and so I said, well, we're going to bring in elders in our community, and they're going to talk about stories, like the creation story I just shared. Mm -hmm. So we share that with the students, 40 of them that were there. And so they, they sat there listening. Everybody was quiet because it was told in our language, in our culture, mm -hmm. this creation story. And everybody was sitting there. Pretty well everybody spoke Mi'kmaq. One or two understood a little bit of it but couldn't speak it well enough. I mean, uh, anyway, so at the end, we gave them pieces of Bristol board. I said, uh, well, okay, all of you draw something from the creation story. And everybody, it was like all this painting up here that they, there's 40 images on Bristol board and we put them all on the wall of this classroom. I mean, two walls really. And then I said, well, tomorrow we're gonna bring a camera, a video camera and you guys are going to film yourselves 
explaining why you chose those colors, why did you choose that image? Wow. And uh, I said, come to school dressed up nice, like as if you're going to go out for the night or something, Imp impress us, I said. And so next day they came, everybody was all, looked really nice and everything, all combed up and, and uh, I said, okay, now we're going to make a treaty. Treaty? Yeah, I said, we're going to make a treaty to say that we agree that we're going to be dressed as best as we can for the rest of this course, like this. Oh, that's really nice. So they all signed a treaty. I mean, they were just basic things, you know, saying, I'll be clean, I'll have good clothes and, and all these things. And I'll be polite in the, in the classroom and I won't. So they agreed, they signed it all. And, and so we brought the video camera out and everybody was so excited. They wanted to talk about why they chose that image and why those colors and so on and so forth. So I said, Nick, tomorrow we're going to sit down and we're going to take pieces of paper and you're going to write down what you said today, what you can remember what you said about your piece of art. So they said, oh my God, eh? And, and, and they wanted to, they, they really wanted to express themselves. And I was telling uh, the teacher that was, uh, she, she was a non-native teacher, and I, I said, most of these students, the reason why they dropped out of school is because they couldn't really express themselves. Mm -hmm. Something that was in here couldn't come out. And the English language was not too... Uh, it wasn't a good vehicle yes. for it, yeah. Yes. So anyway, the next day we went through and it took them about four or five days, the rest of the week, to do their creation. And we used this expository writing that we didn't care, commas, capital letters, or punctuation. And so one that was the minimalist that had a, a one full page and one of the other ones brought in 20 pages explaining everything and what, what he thought. And he was a good English writer. I mean, like he, he I think he was, had a grade 10 education and he was one of the top ones there. And so anyway, he was proud of his work. And so I said, now tomorrow, I said, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk to you individually in, in the private, privacy of a room. And we're going to help you start from which grammar book which spelling and the dictionary and the workshop books that you're going to be working with. And so we were able to gauge which level each one would be. And this is where they, they kind of, it's like we wound them up and, and they went on. And some of them, my brother was one of those, and he's a PhD candidate at Carleton University right now. Wow. And, uh, but it seems to me they felt seen. Yes, I mean, uh, and, and the ability to bring this out, outside of themselves, mm -hmm. to, and, and to be able to express themselves, and to be able to use a, a dictionary and a thesaurus to help them express themselves, I mean, and write. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the vehicle. So you've, had a, you've played a lot of different roles, professionally. Yeah. Can, can, you, can you reel through some of them? And then I... Yeah. Okay, well, I started out as a carpenter in the 1970s. Uh, I got married in 69, uh, had three daughters, I mean, and lived in, in, on the reserve a bit and off the reserve. I mean, I started working as a, a guard in a RCMP lockup. And then I was um, hired by the province to work in a provincial jail lockup. Um, then I was hired as a probation officer. I worked there for three, four years. And then I hit a moose and, and then uh, after I got better, about six months later, uh, the National Parole Board hired me as a parole officer to work in the federal penitentiaries, uh, maximum security and minimum security of people that were sentenced there and were, wanted to come out. And, and they were placed on parole. So I did that kind of work until about 74, 75. And then my dad was killed by a car pedestrian accident. He was the pedestrian. And it was a drunk driver that hit him. 
And he was a colleague of mine that I had worked with at the Department of Indian Affairs who hit him. And he, he had been drinking apparently at a tavern in the afternoon and was trying to get home. And so I didn't want to work with this person anymore. So I left my job. I resigned and I went off to university and I wanted to be educated uh, more because I didn't go to university. I dropped out in grade 10, and I, but I wanted to advance myself. So I applied and applied as a mature student and I was accepted. Uh, I, I had to do two courses, uh, one in social work and one in psychology. And I came back and I was telling the <clears throat> the vice president, I think he was, at the time at the University St. Thomas. I said, I don't know about this psychology. He said, what do you mean? I said, um, this guy named Pavlov and dogs and bells. I said, uh, I don't think that applies to human beings or even us. And uh, I said, this Emil Durkheim and Karl Marx, I mean, uh, these are all theories that happen in industrial Europe or revolution. Uh, and I, I said, enlightenment and, and all these kind of fancy words for me. Mm -hmm. And he said, you have a makings of being a really great university student. You have those questions. You're raising those questions. Go on. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to accept you in this, into St. Thomas University. That was in 74, 75, and the rest was history. I, I, I started, but I, while I was living in Fredericton, I, I worked at the Fredericton Jail in, at night shift, like midnight to 8 o'clock in the morning. That's when I brought out my books and I was studying every now and then. I'd take a break and walk around and check check the cells and if anybody needed anything wow. and then I'd continue. So that's how I survived through university. It took me 10 years to get my bachelor's degree, but I made it. And then I went on to, I wanted to do a law degree. My dad wanted me to be a lawyer. That's why I initially went back to university to go and see if I could be a lawyer. But people kind of encouraged me to try social work uh, I ended up looking into history and anthropology and political science, and that, that's where my heart has been ever since. So I did a, enrolled in a master's in history at uh, UNB. I did some preliminary coursework, but I didn't end up doing the, uh, the thesis work that was required to get your master's degree. Um, so I dropped out, and that was in... 1985, and then I start. I kept working. Um, I became a literacy coordinator for the province uh, of New Brunswick. Uh, worked out at Chatham in one of the community colleges, and uh, after that, I ended up working for the uh, my band in Big Cove uh, for the chief and council. I was doing research, uh, land claim research, and history and culture cross-cultural education and training for non-Indigenous, like the federal government departments. I ended up uh, providing some training for people that were involved in working with Indigenous peoples. So anyway, the, that led to um, me being um, hired uh, on a national level to do a, an inquiry of Indigenous peoples across Canada. It was called the First Nations Circle on the Constitution and was, this was in 1991, 92. Uh, spent five months uh, traveling all across Canada, living out of a suitcase, visiting 80, 82 First Nations communities, speaking to elders, young people, women, uh, Métis people, non-off-reserve in, indigenous people, and Inuit people all across Canada. And uh, we prepared a report for uh, Joe Clark and uh, Brian Mulrooney to present to, to the House of Commons. And then as a result of that, they, they developed the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. And uh, I did lots of research contracts with them uh, fo focused on social, cultural, economic development issues in First Nations communities and suicides. And I was in, being encouraged all along uh, with all the people that were university professors that were working for the 
Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, encouraged me, encouraging me to go and do your master's, finish your master's, go back and go study. And so I registered into a master's program at Carleton University in 1996, 97. I finished it in 99. I got the job at the Canadian Museum of Civilization as a, a native history researcher. And then two years later, I was promoted to a curator. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was a specialist on maritime history, a history of the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Tabernaki, Biotuk. And slowly I became a specialist in Quebec and Ontario and all the way to Manitoba. And what a fascinating way to become deeply acquainted with the country. Oh, yeah. That Museum of Civilization is so phenomenal. So I worked with a, a team to, to put together the First People's Hall, which was a permanent exhibit. It took us seven years to put it together, and finally we launched it in 2003. Incredible. And I stayed 10 more years after to help facilitate, like every now and then we'd have to change our artifacts and put new ones in. And we were also doing our own research. I was doing research on basketry, Mi'kmaq basketry, and, and uh, published a book on, on artifacts of um, Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people at the, at the Canadian Museum of Civilization. And it, it, it had photographs of the artifact, who collected it, possibly who made it. I would, I would try to find out who made, who made it which community it came from, what year it was collected, and so on and so forth. So it was a beautiful book, and uh, I really, I felt so, so proud of my work and invigorated of what I did. And it was a model that the, the uh, museum wanted to use to look at all the cultures across Canada and, and use a similar model of a book focusing on uh, artifacts. And, Beautiful. But but for some cultures, there's like a thousand images for for that particular culture, or even sometimes three, four thousand images or artifacts, and so you had to you couldn't do them all. I mean. <clears throat> so when you left the Museum of Civilization, did you come back to Nova Scotia? I'm originally from New Brunswick, El okay. Elsie Book. Sorry, I, I should yeah. say come to Nova Scotia. Yes, of course. Well, I had applied for a job at. Um, Cape Breton University six months earlier and I went for an interview but I didn't hear back from them uh, for a while mm -hmm. and uh, so it came po to a point where finally around December they said uh, we have a job for you and my retirement date from the museum was July 4 I mean January 4 and they said uh, can you can you start on January 7 I left the museum on Friday and I started at the, at the uh, Cape Breton University as principal of Unamagi College, which was the indigenous uh, college at the university. It's an, uh, an academic uh, institution. As it's part of, it falls under the umbrella of Cape Breton University. Two years later, they promoted me as dean uh, of, of dean of Unamagi College and uh, Aboriginal learning yeah. and uh, and then they promoted me again and promoted me to uh, associate vice president indigenous affairs and Unamagi College so that's my current title at the at the university so that brings me right up to the present date where where Wonderful. I am but you've also had the opportunity to travel the world oh yes um, Part of my work at the Canadian Museum of Civilization sent me to places like Mexico, um, to uh, Brazil in South America. I went across the ocean to Rome, to the Vatican archives and, and uh, the Museo Etnologico, uh, which is a museum that's right in the Vatican that's operated by, by the, the church, actually. It belongs to the Vatican. And so I had an opportunity to check out what their collections were, and it dates back into the early 1600s when the missionaries came to North America and collected uh, sacred pipes, baskets, you name it. It's, it was all, it's in the collections in the Vatican. Fascinating. And, it, and it's kind of like locked. 
it's closed. Mm -hmm. It's only uh, accessible to people that are there in the Vatican. But somehow I, I got um, permission from the papal nuncio in Canada because I approached them and asked them if I could have a look at this wampum belt that they had, mm -hmm. which we thought belonged to the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, I checked it out, but the documentation <coughs> that I found, <coughs> excuse me. Sure. Have a I'm making you talk for a long time. It's my fault. <laughs> the documentation that I found there, uh, it only points to like 1831, and and it seems that the the belt, the wampum belt, was put together by Mohawks, uh, Algonquins, and Nipissings in 1831 in in uh, Lake of the Two Mountains. It's a Sulpician. Um, seigneury at the time, the 18, early 1800s, and it came from there. But my theory is that it's older than that, it, because the imagery on the wampum belt reflects the baptism of Grand Chief Member Two in 1610. I'm not saying it was the Mi'kmaq people that made the wampum belt. My theory is it could have been the two priests, uh, it's not Father Bayard, Pierre Bayard, who was a Jesuit, <clears throat> but Enema Massey uh, traveled extensively with uh, <clears throat> another Jesuit uh, missionary who traveled uh, into the Huron country. And they made uh, wampums from the Huron people. The, the Jesuit made it and sent it to, to France. <clears throat> and there's a copy there with the name Huron written on it, on the wampum belt. And so my theory is that Enema Masse, although there's no existing record that I could find that points to him who could have made that. Um, and it was... <clears throat> I see you as a detective or an investigator in this role. It's yeah. so interesting. The other uh, missionary, Jesuit missionary, was name was Bribeth. Mm -hmm. They have a university yes. college in Montreal, it's called Brebeuf, yeah. and yes. Pierre Trudeau graduated from there. Yes. You've had a fascinating life, and I'm curious as to whether you have a sense of gratitude for the role that you were born into as a hereditary chief. I, I am very grateful. I mean, um, one of the things that uh, has been instilled uh, in me, I mean, uh, is, is not to go around and brag and look at me, look at me, look what I've done. Mm -hmm. and, and the more I, I steer away from that, the more the attention comes in my direction. Instead, I find uh, I'm at a point in my life now, I, I just want to stop everybody and, and say, I want a little bit of privacy. I want my own life. I mean, uh, I would like to sit down and, and do interviews like this every day mm -hmm. and, and share all the knowledge that's all stored up here in my head, mm -hmm. but also maybe sit down and, and transcribe some of the things I'm saying yes. and put them into books and, and provide maybe all this artwork and artists uh, contributing to a book that, that will be educational for my people, I mean, if I could give it to the schools for young people to learn, oh, this was Stephen Augustine, his grandfather, Johnny Simon, this is how they lived their life on Rishabakto Harbor, this is what they're, where they lived, I mean, with like driftwood boards that we collected along the shore and we constructed a, a shelter out of this driftwood and seaweed and, and created a bed inside but we never put a fire inside. It was always burning outside. We would always be cooking our food on, on the fire. I mean, on frying pans or hanging with a, with a pot, boiling potatoes and, and fish and lobster, you name it. I mean, for me, it was a healthy life. I mean, uh, my grandfather would always tell me, when I get up in the morning, take your clothes off and go right in the water right now. <laughs> and it was cold. I mean, the water... The ocean water was cold. Built character. Yeah. But I, <laughs> and resilience. I was also dropped in cold water, too, when I yes, was born. I so, remember. And, and so it, it, 
But today, I mean, uh, I, I, I don't think I can go in cold water anymore. Yeah. <laughs> in my, uh, you and me both. Yeah. What, um, what do you feel about the role you've been able to play as an advisor with this Friends United project? Well, I mean, uh, I've been um, tagged um, very early in my life to, to provide uh, advice um, um, to national chiefs. Uh, I was working for Chief Albert Levi in Big Cove. I mean, uh, I ran against him at one point and he was gracious enough to, after I ran against him, to hire me to work for him, mm -hmm. you know. And, he says, uh, I, like, I like what you say. He says, I, I, I'd like to, for you to make real all the platform or the promises that I was given. Wonderful. And, but people just didn't really, I was too young at the time mm -hmm. to you know, make any sense to everybody, I guess. And anyway, so he hired me and I worked with him and he kind of advised me and, and, and made me feel stronger for who I am working for my people and and I, I just kind of like uh, threw my hat in uh, of running into politics anymore. Uh, I felt I was very useful to my community because I was working for the chief. I could talk and, and deal with issues about social issues, education issues, community development issues, economic development uh, issues. Um, and, and all these other festivals and projects that, that our community were. And so I was playing a major role in, in, in a lot of the things that were happening in the community. So, and, and, and being associated with Albert Levi, he was a very staunch liberal. Mm -hmm. And so he knew Chrétien, he knew Pearson, Lester B. Pearson. He knew, he knew all the big heavyweights and even in New Brunswick, I mean, Romeo LeBlanc was his close friend. And, and uh, um, so when he became Minister of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, and then when he left politics, he became a Lieutenant, I mean, a Governor General of Canada. Mm -hmm. He still maintained the connection. And I, I also, and so Romeo LeBlanc invited me a lot to the government, uh, house there where, where he was living as governor general. And uh, I did a lot of opening ceremonies with my drum. I met lots of foreign dignitaries. I worked at the Canadian Museum of Civilization. So I was involved with a lot of like, uh, they kind of almost kind of had me do a emissary type of work. Mm -hmm. um, like our people, they may be indigenous, but a lot of our people have blue eyes and blonde hair and red hair. Uh, they're, they're almost like ordinary Canadian citizens, mm -hmm. but they, they grow up in the reserve, they speak the language and so on and so forth. And so they had uh, an, an, an Aboriginal person um, welcoming a Chinese delegation from China. Yes. And this young lady, I don't know if she had blonde hair or whether she dyed her hair blonde, but she had blue eyes and uh, Chinese uh, apparently they said, well, we want an Indian to guide us here. So the president at the time, uh, George McDonald, um, he, he uh, phoned me up and he says, can you come down here? And, uh, I said, where are you? He said, well, we're at the Grand Hall. He said, we have an issue. So I came down and, and uh, the Chinese right away, they started making, taking pictures of me. They and, were satisfied with you. <laughs> and uh, so I went over to George and he said, I said, what's going on? He said, well, they weren't happy with uh, our indigenous uh, guide. Uh, they, were, they wanted somebody that looks brown and, and has black hair and maybe long hair, uh, just like you. <laughs> so can you give them a, a, a tour of the First People's Hall? So, I went in there and I toured them around and they were all very gracious and thank you, Shishi. Respectful. And yes, and they gave me lots of gifts and I didn't know what to do with all these <laughs> gifts from China. I mean, and it ended up that I became uh, kind of a ambassadorial person because every time they had uh, cultural attaches oh. from different embassies from around the world that had offices in Canada and Ottawa, well, they would bring guests and they would always call, Stephen, can you give us a tour? 
So I, I ended up, and I was teaching at Carleton University as well. I had received my master's degree from Carleton in 1999, and they started asking me to teach courses there. So I taught after hours, because the museum said, no, you can teach, but don't teach in your work hours. So I taught from six to nine o'clock on Monday nights, and and uh, I taught for ten years. Wow, I I feel like you've been teaching all your life, and I could talk to you all day, but we would run out of <laughs> we would run out of camera battery. But I, I I guess I want to wrap up by saying that to me it seems uh, as although you didn't have a political career, you seem to have had a life of service for your people. And your role in this project of Friends United seems to just, you know, add on to that. Well, I, I, I can understand and, and I, I could, I realized right away that the problems that uh, Rolf was facing uh, in terms of his promotion of his books and art and, and so on um, by our people, I mean, uh, some that were very kind of strongly opposed to the way he was going about uh, encouraging our people. I mean, uh, but he, he took all the necessary ethical principles of dealing with art, uh, intellectual property rights of the artists. I mean, he, he was very mindful of those things and he, he copied uh, artwork because the, the the contracts or the agreements that they signed, that Rolf can um, use them for promotion, could maybe uh, take images of it, you know, not as a whole, but maybe parts of it. And so he could adjust and change and whatever. And, and in terms of promoting this center and promoting the individual, I mean, uh, so there was a lot of um, very good, good meaning or meaningful um, relations that he initially developed with uh, our peoples and, and um, I'm very grateful for that and uh, you can see in, in here you can pan the camera around this room and, and see uh, all the different kind of art. There's Inuit art, there's yes. Northwest Coast totem poles that are here. Um, um, it's such a celebration. Yes. Of our, of, of the, I think uh, the whole country of, of First Nations, Indigenous, Aboriginal, and Inuit art, Inuit art. and it's it's um, almost a a feeling that grabs you when you come in. Oh yes, I mean uh, it's it's emotional. I mean it's almost it reminds me when I first started working at the Canadian Museum of Civilization. I was so overwhelmed with the building, the curvy linear. Uh, Douglas Cardinal, I had known him already and I knew about his work at the, and I never imagined that I would be working there uh, because in 1991 when we launched the First Nation Circle on the Constitution, we launched it there at the museum in the Grand Hall and I, and I was kind of like so impressed with all the, and I was given a little tour of some of the area in, in the collections and I, I got very emotional. I mean, I got teary-eyed, almost like you here earlier. I mean, uh, it, it just caught me off guard. I wasn't expecting it, you know, like I was just, and, and just the smell of the, the leather from, from Inuit people who have built kayaks up north and somehow this 20, 30 foot kayak is sitting there made out of skin and, and wood, driftwood. I mean, it, it wasn't really plain lumber. It was like whatever they could find and, and kind of carve together and form, form a shape of a kayak, I mean. So it's, a, it's a, a tangible thing, but it represents so much more yeah. because of what went into. It reminded me of the, the dwelling place that my grandfather and I kind of snapped together from driftwood and all these little pieces of board and, and rough lumber and, and, and just, so, and we would live in that for the whole summer. Uh, and, and, you know, we would go away and then I would come back sometime in the fall and it's all gone. It's 
the tide came up and kind of took all, everything away and the November tides were always really high and, and, and they would just come up right to the grasslands and take everything up. But it was natural anyway. Yeah, so, but it kind of, that, that feeling of forlornness, yes. that, that life, way of life has drifted away. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we came back from Germany, uh, I was um, 13, 14, and I started to, I didn't right away join my grandfather until I was like 14, 15. I, I felt a little bit more sure of myself, mm -hmm. and my parents kind of said, okay, you can go back home and, and go visit your grandfather and go visit your aunts and uncles. So I went back to the reserve and, and lived with my grandparents, I mean, during the summer, and, and we went back to those places. But what was different this time was there were fences now. I mean, people, signs saying no trespassing, and we would come to one place and try to set up something and somebody would come out and say, well, you're not allowed there anymore. The, the old man, he passed away. I bought this property, it's mine. Don't come here anymore. Mm -hmm. And so we would end up kind of drifting around and finding other places where nobody lived or whatever. And so we would camp there. And it was, I started seeing a change in, 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 in our culture um, because all of a sudden, after the 50s into the 60s, we didn't have that freedom anymore of, of going on the land and, and taking what it was that contributed to our cultural identity, mm -hmm. like our food, our shelter, medicine, so on and so forth. Came, Being connected to it. Came from the land. Yeah. And, and so when that starts to be um, restricted from us, then, then we become disconnected mm -hmm. from the land and the disconnection that late you're talking about, mm -hmm. it's slowly kind of going out. I mean, it's but it's on a dimmer. That's it, so it's an the, ember. This is it's an ember. Oh, I love that. I, I think of a dimmer that when you turn yeah. a light all the way down on a dimmer, it looks like it's out, but you haven't clicked it yeah. and you just need to turn it back up. But that ember is such a powerful yeah. symbol. That spark. Yes. Grandf this... Grandfather spark is still oh. there. And that's what this place is about for me. Yes, for me too. And I think for Rolf as well. Um, I know he understands and he's trying his darndest and his best to understand fully. But I also I, I understand his frustration for not fully comprehending everything yet. Mm -hmm. And he's reaching out and trying to grasp it all. It's, it's difficult. It's, there's like so he's, much. He's a great gardener, though. He's growing it, and he's realizing that there are challenges here or there, but you just, you know, with patience and perseverance and, and passion and purpose, yeah. he is, uh, he's growing it. And it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful cause, and I'm happy to be here. We're on a wave. With you. We're on a wave, baby. Tsunami. <laughs> I like that. It's just... just Building up. I mean, and, and, and this kind of uh, addresses um, my, my, my study. I mean, my thesis I did was on um, looking for a middle ground approach to learning. Yes. Because I looked back statistically um, with Stats Canada, <laughs> um, the way they described it, I mean, the numbers, 75% of our people that started grade one dropped out before they arrived in university. Mm -hmm. And I was one of them. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at mainstream society, it was only 25% mm -hmm. that didn't make it, and the rest, the rest did. It's heartening. So I said, well, we have these two streams. Is there a middle ground where we can draw from the mainstream and we can draw from core elements from the indigenous culture and and can we build this middle ground approach and go forward to provide learning and knowledge and education for indigenous children or young people but not only that for mainstream society young people as well Absolutely. because they never learned anything about our culture and tradition nor did we and there's so much wisdom and and richness there when you talk about your 
the creation story, for instance, there's so much that we can all benefit from. Yeah, so, so I, took, I took that aspect of my culture, <clears throat> something that I learned <clears throat> informally from my ancestors, grandfather, great-grandfather Simon Joe Simon and his wife Isabel, and then my father Johnny Simon, and, <clears throat> and my grandmother on my father's side, Agnes Thomas, who lived to be 100 years old, I mean, they were the ones that taught me everything in my culture, my language, my traditions, the ceremonies that I do, and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So I said, is there a middle ground approach that, I, that our kids can learn those things and then take from mainstream society basic elements of math, science, geography, uh, English, grammar, spelling, and all those things? And is, is there... And my answer was, yes, there is a middle ground approach. It's right here. I, I am the middle ground. I love it. And so I w when I was interviewed for this job at Unamagi College at Cape Breton University, that was my, my, uh, my presentation, that I was looking for that middle ground approach. And this opportunity, becoming the head of Unamagi College, will help me realize that dream, the dream job that I was hoping that I would get to help realize the middle ground approach to learning. And lo and behold, uh, Cheryl Bartlett, Dr. Cheryl Bartlett and, and Mi'kmaq elders, two of them, uh, Merdina Marshall, God bless her soul, she's passed on into the spirit world, but Albert, her husband, Albert Marshall, they helped uh, Cheryl Bartlett develop uh, what they call a two-eyed scene, Methodolo methodological approach to, to learning in a scientific context. Mm -hmm. So one eye is to look at things from an indigenous eye and the other from a scientific eye. And, and my, my concept was looking for a middle ground approach to learning by bringing these two elements. So these two ways of learning uh, can come together and help strengthen uh, what Unamagi College could be or should be um, in the near future. But I'm, I'm, I'm on almost the end of my, my trail. Uh, I'm going to be 70 years old this summer, and um, uh, I'd, I'd like to sit back and, and spend more um, meaningful time for myself to be able to create um, things like this, books, videos, uh, these kind of things to educate my people who may not be into books too much, but maybe more into, into looking at videos or learning from, from a popular education kind of way. Well, congratulations and thank you so much for the role you've played in creating and sustaining Friends United because it's, uh, it's really a thing of beauty. And I thank you for spending the time with me today. I'm glad to help. I, I'd like to see this. Uh, I, I would like to see centers like this um, all across the Maritimes, all across Canada, in indigenous communities. Something that will help help the indigenous people express themselves artistically, creatively, and and to be able to speak about this thing, um, and 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 to invite non-indigenous cultures to come in enjoy this together with us and, and, and share in our bountifulness mm -hmm. and in our spark. Spread the flame. <laughs> from, from your lips to the Creator's ears. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Well, Alin. That's thank you in Mi'kmaq. Well, Alin. Say it. Well, Alin. <laughs> well, Alin. Well, Alin. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you.